Hey, hey, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't talk when it's recording. Oh, <laughs> that's going to make this podcast very weird. Yes. <laughs> well, you can just mime it to me. Yes. And then I'll say what you're saying. It'll be like a quiet place, the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Welcome to the Film Riot Podcast. I'm Ryan Conley. And today on the show, we have Ryan Booth, who, if you, if you don't know who Ryan Booth is, you probably live under a rock. Ryan has done everything from high-end commercials to mini docs to his own short film with The Heights, which was amazing. You can jump over to our podcast page, which you can find a link for in the show notes to see all of that work. He's, he's just done tons of stuff. He comes from the world of music, then into cinematography, and now into directing, which is where he really belongs, moving towards his first feature, which we're going to talk about a little bit on the show today. But before we get to that, I want to thank our sponsors, starting with Westcott. Westcott is an amazing company. I've talked about them on this show. I've talked about them a ton on Film Riot. They have some of my favorite lights with the Flex Light and the Ice Light, both of them such versatile and useful lights, especially with the Flex Light, different sizes. You can bend them and put them literally anywhere. Then if you get the battery option with it, then it just gets even more versatile. It's a great way to light car interiors as well. Then I also want to thank Updesk. Updesk has the the Updesk Home, which has the kind of aesthetic that you've been looking for without the expensive price tag. It's a 60 inch long, 30 inch wide desktop. You can move your entire workspace up and down with a single press of a button. So there's no more excuses to just be sitting all the time, which is so unhealthy for us. And you know, just the nature of what we do has us sitting down all day long, which is really, really bad for you. I did an episode on that, uh, which I, I talk about the health issues with that on Film Riot, which there's a link for that on the website as well. But now, I'm going to stop talking about all this and get right into it with Ryan Booth. I think a lot of people know you as a DP, but really what you are, and definitely in my eyes, is a director. And definitely headed in that direction and a badass one at that, which I only have, I'm only i only saying because you're right in front of me. Of course. Yeah. Naturally. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, when thinking about doing this podcast with you, I was just, you know, it feels like we're both very much in the same sort of place. We both want to direct narrative features, and we're both just trying to figure out how to get there because nobody's path is the same, right? Yeah. So I tweeted out for questions and uh, from our mutual friend, Jody Wax, he said that uh, we should spend some time talking about uh, just making something. Both of us are doers and that's not completely normal, casting out doubt and fears and just doing it. And I thought that was a really interesting thing to sort hmm. of go at because it's basically the heart of what we're both trying to accomplish. Yes. I mean, I, I think... Sometimes it feels like maybe almost to a fault, like <laughs> <laughs> that you're just doing. Yes, like because yeah. I'm not like I, I remember I was talking to this director when I was kind of like transitioning from DPing into directing, and like uh, I'd been talking with a few commercial production companies. They had kind of reached out, and I was starting some initial conversations. And I remember running into this director at I don't remember where we were. We were just like some dude's apartment in LA, and uh, he was like, "Hey man, how, safe. how's everything going? I heard you were like." talking to blah 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 taking meetings you know or whatever <laughs> and uh, i was like uh yeah i mean like i guess some random companies reached out and i had a few meetings but it didn't ever feel very formal and he was like oh, okay yeah i met with this people and i anyway it's this is a very long and boring story because i can't talk very specifically but basically he just like said this company's good for this and this company's good for this but i want to do this and in two years i want to do this and then like that'll set me up so that like once i do a certain number of commercials then i'll be ready to like do a certain feature and like blah 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 blah, blah. and it was all of a sudden it was like 10 years down the road and he was like had everything mapped out that's very specifically planned yeah and i just looked at him like i don't know what i'm doing a month from now <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> yeah <laughs> like if i know what i'm doing a month from now like i'm doing great yeah. you know yeah and so i feel like for me it has been kind of in the absence of knowing exactly how to proceed the answer has always been just do something mm -hmm. you know i mean it's how i got into filmmaking in the first place a friend sent me the, the beyond the still contest link and i was like i kind of have always wanted to do this sounds interesting and like just called some friends and like we just made the thing yeah. you know and i feel like that's every kind of path forward or moment where like there's been an inflection point in my career has come from just bleh, making this do thing. a thing yeah but i mean that's like the sum of everything that makes up who we are as filmmakers it's yeah. just we i'm interested in music and you know all these other hobbies and i pursue that if i have i've always found like if i have a passion i pursue it because i feel like there's a reason for that for me as a person and what my voice will end up being yeah so i mean i think all those things are good either way maybe some have been distractions i don't i don't really know no i mean i i, I don't think you can know what, like part of getting older part of like getting to be a part of 
cool creative work is a lot of times you start to realize that the things you thought were going to be big moments or things that kind of moved you forward were like nothing came from them. And yeah. then the things that you had no clue, no thought, of, but you just kind of like made it and it was like, ah, just made it. Who cares? Those end up being the things that like some random person sees <laughs> that, and that you is, get that phone call. That you know? is so true because two of the things that were like absolute last minute things that were done in just a couple of days were the things that got me the most meanings. Yeah. Which is just so weird. It feels like that's how it goes though, just because I, f- I feel like what people are looking for, and for me now at this point, like when, when I'm in a position to hire people, like what I'm looking for is there is a kind of a, a quality that people have it's not pushiness by any means, but is this kind of like the idea that the train is already moving, Yeah, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter where, but like the train's already moving. Do you want to be a part of it or not? I think when people are able to kind of convey that to other people, that people tend to come alongside and go like, yeah, like I would love to help out, you know, whatever that might look like. Yeah, totally. And that, that sort of thing works across the board, I think. Like that's how I always even talk to sponsors is like, hey, I'm making this yes. with or without you. Do you yeah. want to be a part of it? Yeah. I'm kind of with you on the I don't know what I'm doing in a month thing. Although yeah. like everything I do, I feel like is strategic. Like, you know, even the latest film I'm working on, Ballistic, was like a strategic thing. There were like some notches in my belt that I haven't quite clicked off yet to help me have all the experience I feel like I need to really, you know, be able to command the ship well on yeah. a feature film. But I mean, you know. Know, it's inception how it came about and uh you know how long i had to write and all that that was pretty spur of the moment mm. but knowing i wanted to do something like that like these are the things that i haven't really i, I don't feel like i have the proper experience in so i want to make something like this next mm. that's kind of how i've done all my short films yeah uh, but it's always just like oh next month i'm going to shoot this sort of thing so i have to have a script <laughs> by then mm. what's your writing process it's always a little bit different um Sometimes it's like a thread of an idea that I already had, and then it comes out. I, I think it's two totally different things. My short film writing process is usually spur of the moment. Okay. Uh, the feature writing process or you know treatment building process or story breaking process comes from different places for me. Like um, I have an idea of a moment, and then it starts flushing out from there. And then I realize that, oh, it's not about this surface thing. What it really is about to me thematically is this and then Mm. it catapults it forward Mm. the one i'm working on right now which could be my first feature fingers crossed was really birthed out of a thematic idea and then everything built on top of that more heavily or you know just something i wanted to say which is newer for me before it was like i always stressed out about like you know i start from a hey it would be really cool if this sort of moment happened then i started Mm. building which i still do and i don't think there's anything wrong with that So that's kind of a little different. When it comes from the short film side, it's more like, here are the things that I know I can do. Ballistic was sort of, I had this team in LA that I knew wanted to do something, was totally down to work on something with me. It was a stunt team. And, you know, I was like, you know, here's the the budget that we have. What's the coolest type stuff that we could pull off? And Mm. he just gave me a list of things that we could do. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. And then started shaving away, like, "Eh, not that, not that. And then just an idea struck. And then, you know, it'd be really cool if X was happening. And then I realized, that oh this means this Mm. and then i just chased that okay and then after i found out the it all means this which i don't i don't know how many people do it that way and it's probably not that useful like uh tell for me is like three layers of something it's a story about a guy who kills his girlfriend it's a story about guilt and shame and then underneath that it's a story about something that actually happened to me that had nothing to do with murder but everything in the script had you know, meant something else that no one will ever understand or get. And they're not really supposed to. And ballistic is another one of those. Proximity was another one of those, which is interesting because I wrote it with Seth too, but never told him like what everything meant underneath it for me. So it, it's, I don't know. Did I just answer your question at all? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think writing to me is a thing I'm particularly fascinated in at the moment because it's the only part of filmmaking that you don't need anything to like, you can just start right now. Yeah. And I feel like that that's like a really, Especially for like the idea of wanting to kind of generate or start down the path of making features. Mm -hmm. It does feel like at least on some level, like being comfortable with the idea of sitting down to write feels like you have to at least address that even if you don't end up writing your own films. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, I'm very fascinated by writers and writing just because I feel like it's the tip of the spear. Totally. And I I think it's really interesting because my education in writing came from filming it and finishing it Uh and, and seeing that end process and then realizing the things that seem to be right on paper. Once you really step back and look at the whole picture, you're like, I'd never flush this person out. Right. I never flushed out the idea that I had that I was trying to because I didn't do X, Y, and Z. So I, I think that's really interesting. Like when you're writing, it's 
hard to sort of take a full step back and get out of just that one page that you're currently in and yeah. look at the thing as a whole and sees, well, is everything firing from that one idea that's working maybe on one page, but on, you know, page three doesn't work compared to page 13. And right. Do you ever find that? Yeah, I do. I mean, I'm like, so <laughs> at this point, I would say my day job is commercial directing. Right. And so for these commercial treatments, I'm having to write like 50 pages. <laughs> well, not, I mean, designed. So not okay. not like 50 script pages. Okay. I bet okay. it's like six to 10,000 words okay. per, per treatment. So right. like 10 or 12 kind of prose pages. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's a lot. And that's I'm doing a lot for a like, commercial treatment. Yeah. yeah. And I'm doing like multiple ones of them at a time. So I'm probably writing like I don't know 50 to 60 prose pages a month at this point which is like that's a lot that's writing a lot that is um, a lot so I feel like I'm learning a lot about how to just grind through trouble spots and figuring out you just know, do the work having to do the work yeah yeah for sure so it doesn't feel completely transferable to script writing by any means because there's a there's a language and a an economy to writing a script that feels very antithetical to the way that i have to write my commercial treatments which is very kind of descriptive and like i have to fill in all the gaps right. for the reader when i'm writing a commercial treatment whereas i feel like really good scripts you know, like I read Hell or High Water the other day and I was just like shocked by the economy of phrase. Totally. You could say two lines and it conveys mm -hmm. everything you need to know about the, you know, the relationship between the brothers. Yeah. And I'm like, I would have written like three paragraphs, you know, <laughs> right, to say this. Right. And so I feel like for me, I'm having to kind of work up the courage to say more with less on the kind of the script writing phase. But I don't know. What was the question? I forgot. I actually forgot because I was just interested in what you were saying. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I watched The Social Network on the airplane down to Texas yesterday, which that movie continues to grow on me. Like every time I see it, I feel like I see something else new. Yeah. And I watched the opening sequence, which is an incredible sequence in conversation. But basically the opening sequence, if you just only watch the opening sequence, it's actually the entire movie. Like the whole plot of the whole movie is in that initial conversation between the two of them. Right. Down to the like the talking about crew, talking about finals clubs, talking about making a lot of money. You know, like all of these things, like the whole arc of the story is in this one kind of conversation. And like the idea that that was intentional that did not happen by accident right you know i think it has been a really cool kind of idea i'm working on a short right now the banker robber short or whatever mm -hmm. and it's given me the courage to go like oh to like personalize this and like have something to say like i've made this one character smoke virginia slims which from the beginning the whole kind of film is about a woman who dresses like a man and like not a lot of dudes smoke Virginia Slims. Right. So from the beginning, like if you know, you would go like something's weird about this picture. But then the Virginia Slim that she's smoking, she drops onto the parking lot floor. And that's the thing that like unravels the story at the end. And so like, I think starting to get comfortable as a writer of like, just because I know I'm putting it there doesn't mean that like everyone else will see it. Yeah, I, exactly. I think because that to me, like when I'm watching a great movie and like the whole thing kind of reveals itself in the end and you're like, oh my God. And then you go back and you see like, no, no, they were like, you know, the buildings were being built the whole time. Yeah. And like, you can go back and go, no, they were just telling me the information I needed to know to kind of arrive at that moment. And I think for me, like kind of pulling back the curtain a little bit and going like, you know, I'm not talking about the Virginia Slims in my script. It comes up a few times throughout the course and it means something. And that's okay to like have it mean something. In right. fact, that's like a good... It should. It should mean something. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds like a very obvious revelation, but I feel like in the process of writing, I think I'm starting to realize that yeah. the small things like that are what make it interesting. Yeah. And I, I always say, I think there's a huge difference between knowing something and understanding it. Yeah. And that's what I mean when I'm... I, I always talk about light switches on the show and stuff. And that's what I mean by light switches. Like, yeah, I, I heard people talk about this. But that light switch didn't really turn on until just now. And I think experience is really the only thing that gives you that understanding. Yeah. So I totally know what you're talking about. And and that kind of goes with something uh, for me that I'm like, no, it's okay. That's a part of it is like actually just continuing to work on the thing and, and technically work on it and, mm. you know, doing the work on yeah. it where it's like, it feels wrong to where, you know, I've birthed this like creative idea that felt like pure when it first came out. And now I'm chopping away at it and changing things from my original thought process to make it quote unquote better, which it is. 
but it it starts to feel like technical work, which it is. Yeah. And uh, coming to a place where that's okay. Yeah. Because I think that's where you find those Virginia Slim moments and the beginning of social network is when you step back and you are technically looking at, okay, well now right. how do I get them through craft? How do I get them there? Yeah, totally. Which is, an, that's been an interesting, like probably, you know, sounds stupid revelation for me. Right. Is like, no, no, it's okay to do the technical work, you know, not the thematics of it or, you know, just the creative portion of it. But, you know, I have to one plus one to get two. Yes. Which yeah. has been interesting. Yeah. It's, a, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have, Writing makes me feel stupid a lot. <laughs> Why is that? Just because you feel like, do you just feel like you're not a good writer? Do you feel like you're not equipped to it? Um, I mean, writing is when you like have the idea and I feel like that, yeah. like the idea part of things, not just the initial idea, but the, like the working the idea out part mm-hmm. of things, you just don't get that for free. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, it's just like really, really hard. Yeah. And then I look at like, it makes me watch other movies and go like, oh my God, these people are so good. <laughs> I know. It's just, and it feels effortless when you're watching it. You know, know, it's not. It's not. But it just feels that way. It does. And you just feel unworthy. It does. Yeah. Do you have, um, do you have like lightning strike ideas where it's like you're you're beating your head up against the wall over something and then you kind of let it go for a little bit and then all of a sudden it's just ex- this explosion of ideas everything laying itself out yes sadly can tell the most recent example was from a commercial treatment that i was writing <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which um is an unusual writing process but basically i needed to like have an idea for how to convey kind of protagonist in the spot is able to like creatively see things that no one else sees Mm. and so without going into some cheater pov or like something you know and that's hard because how how much time are you working with uh like 36 hours no no i mean like how how long is the piece oh 60 seconds that's crazy. That's crazy. So it, it's like, how do you sell this idea that like he can see things that nobody else can? Yeah. And um, I was riding the subway, which has actually been an amazing place for just general thinking of things. Because living in New York now, like when I'm traveling places, I'm not having to pay attention to where I'm driving or going. And there's all kinds of weirdo people around. So like, it's just very inspirational. Yeah, overload. it's like very helpful to like, kind of go like, the hell was that person thinking when they left their house? You right. know, or whatever. <laughs> um, that- um, scarf? I don't yeah. think so, I'm sister. Like, wow, man. But yeah, no, I was lit- <laughs> literally on the subway and I had this flash of an image of like basically all of these like diagrams and instructions and stuff were like written on the side of the wall in like invisible ink, basically. And this light passes across and you can see it. And so I was like, that's how you do it. Like you have art department paint this whole alleyway with invisible ink and then we sweep a light across it you know as he turns you see him seeing like everything and it'll be like this whoa and i literally stood up straight on the subway like with my hands up and i was like notepad that's it (laughs) (laughs) and i was like that's it but we were like coming to a stop and it was my stop to get off and i was like don't forget it don't forget it don't forget it i'm saying this on the subway standing up you know like don't forget it don't forget it and i'm like i'm sure you're totally normal i am now one of the people that Uh someone else is going like i love riding the subway because look at all these weirdos yeah what was that guy thinking but that felt like very much like a the idea came from somewhere else yeah you know right now i'm rewriting my feature stages the music feature and that one just feels like which is based off your short right based on yeah well i i would say the short is like a cousin to the feature um there's a couple of characters but even their central relationship has changed so it's dramatically different Gotcha. I mean, same world, but different characters. But I mean, yes, the short doesn't happen in the feature. It's not a part of the feature. Mm-hmm. So, gotcha. Um, but anyway. But not that, whiplash. Yes, not whiplash. But that has felt very, like, not revelatory at all. Just, like, staring at the cursor, blinking at me, going. Now what? Now what? Yeah. That's interesting. Um, The one that I'm breaking right now, which I'm most excited about, is an idea that I've had for like, I don't know, like three years. And it's a concept that I've always been like really stoked about. And everybody I told was like, oh, yeah, that. And it's like, cool. But I don't know how to get out of that one sentence concept. You know what I mean? Like, what's the in? And then I realized that the person that the thing was happening to isn't who we follow. It's the person that knows something's going on with them. That's who we follow. That's cool. Yeah, because the whole thing is about a certain kind of grief, uh-huh. which I haven't felt. I haven't gone through, but right. I have had to watch a loved one go through it. Uh-huh. And then I realized I'm trying to write from the perspective of somebody who's feeling something I've never felt. Yeah. I mean, a degree of it. So yeah, sure, I can sympathize and relate, but I just couldn't get into it until I separated myself from that character and then found a character to attach myself yep. to that I could see this person go... 
And then once that happened, it was just, just unlocked idea everything. Overlooked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for the next three days, it was that hands up moment, like, oh, oh, God, yeah. write it down. <laughs> I'm just an Evernote every two seconds yes. to just have the app open 24/7, exactly. just writing down, like, oh, yes, then this, then this. Yeah. And it's like how Seth says, like, and then that stops. Yes. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Is the party what? over? Yeah. <laughs> Did everybody go home? I'm lonely. That's again. right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so then, then that's the scariest part is when the ideas yeah. stop and now you start having to, you have to put them together now. Yes. But I think, you know, like you're doing these commercials and they're 60 seconds long and you're having to come up with, how do I convey this to an audience in the the fastest, most comprehensible way possible? And that, you know, feels to me like what I've done with Film Riot and what I've done with my short films, where it's like, you put yourself in this very tiny box with all these restrictions and you still have to convey something and not only convey them, but give them an experience. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's such a great teacher to like how to take that to a feature and, uh, you know, do a lot with a little and constantly be moving things forward quickly without having to, like, be Captain Exposition. Right. So I, I've really loved that, like, taking a feature. And, I mean, probably to a fault, like, with Sentinel, I just told you absolutely nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just yeah. more about taking you on an experience of something. Right. It was like, eh, I'd rather not say a word about anything. Yeah. yeah so, 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 you know, sometimes to a fault. But it's like, but can I, if I tell you, I think that's interesting. If I tell you nothing, can I still give you an experience and can I still attach you? It's like, how much do I really need to tell you to give you something? You know mm. what I mean? Have yeah. you ever thought about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think sometimes when I'm in an airplane, like a movie will be on and I'll be doing something else. But like, I'm basically, there's a movie on and I'm like, you can't hear the dialogue. Yeah. And like, it's amazing how the good movies, you can basically understand what's happening and yeah. not hear a word that they're saying. And I think that that's related to what you're saying. But I do think that like that kind of skill set of being able to like, you know, it's not just the dialogue, it's the blocking and yeah. the shot selection. And I mean, humans are like incredibly fine tuned at reading people's faces. And like, I think a good performance from an actor is, I don't know what the percentage is, but a huge percentage of it is just their kind of the emoting on their face. And yeah. I feel like those are all like things to understand. It's not just the kind of written structure of like what happens, you know, there's, I think something happens in performance that is, that you can practice in commercials and shorter form projects for sure. Yeah, you totally. Know? And kind of like just hone in on. Yeah. But I, I think what, what's been interesting to me lately that I've just been thinking about a lot is like, what do I need to give you for a story? Like, what is what is a story even? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. Because I mean, I walk around in normal life and I see two people interacting and something happens and I'm fascinated by that. And now I'm constructing based off of life experience what might be going on. Mm. And that's really interesting to me. It's like, do I really need to give you every ounce of information for you to really enjoy this and invest yourself in this? And I, I, I think we've gotten that way just because of what films have have been and have taught us what they're supposed to be and that they're supposed to be this very specific setup and there's supposed to be this very specific payoff and emotionally mm. and it's like but what if there isn't like what if like annihilation is a really good example recently where uh, so little is given to you and then you have to paint it with your own brush mm. and i i love that stuff have you thought about that at all is that like a part of your thinking when you're when you're putting the story together are you thinking about like i really need to specifically pay off these things in the end to have that very like like rigid act one, act two, act three, which I'm not talking against that. I mean, most of, most of the concepts I, I have right now are are pretty traditional in that way. Mm -hmm. Or do you ever think that you have to break out of that or do you just not care and you just write? I don't know if I care a lot. I, here's what I, I think. I will answer your question with a story. I feel like that what I've been thinking about more than, than what you're describing is the phases of production. So mm -hmm. there's the, like, what do I need to accomplish to move to the next phase of this production. So I have to write my script. At what point is the script ready to move into the production part of it? And then when I'm in production, what do I need to shoot? How much of this do I need to capture and in what capacity and blah, 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 to get me to the point where I have a hard drive full of footage that I can edit. Yeah. And once I'm in the edit, I might not have needed X, Y, or Z scene to tell the story, but I did need X, Y, or Z scene to help me understand what the scene meant, to help the actor understand what this very specific relationship meant, which informs like the overall arc of the story, which allows me to cut out the thing that actually was probably a little extraneous. Yeah. So I think that like that is what I've been thinking the most about is like, at what point is this script ready to go into production knowing that, you know, are the things in this script going to help 
me discover things on set in a way that helps me get the most footage that's usable on my hard drive so that I can actually make a film. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's been less about like three act structure and all of that kind of stuff as much as just like, you know, when is it time to move to the next phase? Yeah. Totally. I think the way that I thought about it a lot has been uh, just moving away from my own thing and like, totally being a hypocrite on my own thought, because that's just something I've been thinking about recently, because I, I think more with short films than with features. It's just like I end up just wanting to give more experience and less exposition. Mm. I just, just don't care. Like you can figure it out based on this. You could figure it out like proximity. Do I really need to tell you what's going on? You've seen movies like this, figure it out. Mm. Now let's go and do the other things. Mm -hmm. But especially with like trying to break some of these features, I think about it all in like sections less than, I don't know that I've ever thought in acts. I've never thought in acts. If you made me pinpoint like act breaks in movies, I'm I would terrible not at get it. it right. I know some people who are great at it and I'm like, should I be good at it? No. <laughs> I don't know no. I'm good at it. Who was it? I think it was, maybe it's Ron Howard. Was it his masterclass that he said, basically he directs 10 minutes of the movie at a time. Oh, that's great. That that's like the only thing he worries about is these current 10 minutes. I love that. And how does it set up? Like, how did you get to this set of 10 minutes and where are you going next? Yeah, that's great. Cause that, that's kind of like what I even mean by the phases. It's like, it's this section, which is like its own short film and this section, which is on. So I'm making an anthology, which all goes together right. with the same characters. Right. And that's helped me a lot thinking of it in those terms. Cause I really like to, even in my short films, every scene has a beginning, middle and end as much as possible. Right. So it's just thinking all of it with all of it in those terms. And then, you know, obviously setting up things that are going to pay off later, but that's, a you know, the technical work that we talked about before. Right. So it's, yeah, it's nice to hear that you don't think in acts either. I don't, I, I've, I never have, I haven't really understood even how to write like that. Yeah. I wouldn't think about it like that. Which, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, obviously. There's a lot of... No, no, no. Some of I the mean, most talented writers I know do it in sort of that yeah, way. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I've told Seth before, but I do feel like that the, like the circle thing for me, mm -hmm. like finding moments that connect to other moments in the film... Yeah, I love that. ...is the thing actually that's been the most helpful for me in terms of like writing my own stories is like... And I don't I don't really clock stuff because I don't understand how to do it. Um <laughs> I, I mean, like that you and I, yeah. I don't know if it's laziness, but we're like, eh, I'll just make I'm not it. Gonna do it. I don't, I'm, I don't not, know. I'm not going to put the math into that thing. Well, and I've, I mean, I've always felt like there's a, <laughs> there's like people who make things and then there's people who analyze things that other people have made. Right. And like, I am 99.9% .9 convinced that like any analysis that we do of a, th of a final thing that the person who made it did not think of did any of it. it. Which is why I hate video essays. Yeah. But that's a whole other podcast. Yeah, I mean, because that's just like, no one thinks like that when they're making right. anything. Right. Which I think is really amazing. Like, I think the fact that, that something could stand up to that kind of analysis yeah. means like they did a good job, but they did not think it while they were making it. Yeah, no I, I way. I think that's when you made something great though, is when you've, you've told the story, you've given meaning to it. People got, you know, some of that meaning, but you leave it open enough to where I can bring my experiences to where, you know, the canvas isn't finished. Yes. There's some spots, you know, waiting for paint and I get to bring mine to it. And then I get to extract what it means to me. Yeah. I think that's when you have like something really great yeah. that can be watched over and over and over again. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, I think the story clock thing for me, while I don't clock things, is like a helpful visualization. Yeah. Um, when I'm writing, that's felt way more instructive than three act structure. Yeah, that's me. been really helpful for me too, just chucking those ideas in and then being like, well, you know, where would I place them possibly and how could these all connect? But I think what I do the most part, which I don't know, you might be this way because we're agreeing a lot, is like, which, you know, sometimes I feel like I should just be quiet about like this it just seems like nobody else is this way it's just everything feels more instinctual to me like mm -hmm. this goes here because it feels right that's why mm -hmm. you know and um it's like following my gut often i mean obviously when you're on set and you're directing that's really what you have you know obviously you have the plans that you put into place and the intentions of why but sometimes it's just like this feels wrong so no mm -hmm. um you know the camera needs to come up a foot explain to me why I can't, but it does, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I rarely ever find those to be wrong. When have you found it to be wrong? Have you, like, is there something you can think of? I think of a, a time. Really? But in fact, the only times that I've been like, damn it, is when I didn't follow my gut. When ah. somebody else was like, mm, I think it should be this. And I'm like, all right, you know what? I'm going to trust you on this. Let's do that. And then I get into the editing room later and I'm like, why did I not follow my gut? Huh. So I can think of a bunch of times where I should have, and I can't think of any that I shouldn't have. 
I'm going to pause right there to again thank our sponsor, Westcott, who is an industry-leading lighting manufacturer that specializes in lighting and light control for filmmakers around the world. They are the originators of the Flexite LED system, the Ice Light 2, and Fast Flags. Westcott continues to develop new products with the expectation of durability, portability, and high-end results. Whether you're just getting into filmmaking or continuously on set of feature films, Westcott has and will continue to have your back and all your lighting needs. Again, I use their stuff all the time i could not recommend it enough it's high quality and super versatile stuff so definitely check that out on our website filmriot.com forward slash podcast find the episode page and check out their stuff there but now let's get back to it with ryan and I, I love people like even, you know, you did it. There's pushback, but, you know, if I have a reason, it's like, all right, that's what we're doing. Mm-hmm. So I love that pushback. It's like when you're just doing all the things I say, well, then almost anyone could do that. Yeah, It's for like, sure. you know, bring in your opinions and why I might be wrong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, just understanding what's the intention of the scene? What are you trying to accomplish? Understanding that. And then being like, you know, I get what you're trying to accomplish here, but if we do that, I don't think you're accomplishing it as well as if you do this. Mm. Like I remember you doing that on Ghost House a yeah. couple of times and you were dead on. Like I was doing this whole extra move around, which sucked the life out of when we should have just stopped. Chase did that a ton of like, shouldn't we just do this? I'm like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. fine, sure. Do it your way. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, look that's, at you guy. That, yeah, look yeah. at you buddy. That's That's been something that I've been, because I started from, I'm the writer, producer, director, yeah. camera operator, cinematographer, you know, boom operator sometimes you know i've in short films i put mics on mic stands you know mm-hmm. uh and pulled my own focus and all that so what we all came from mm-hmm. so but i did that for a while like mm-hmm. even proximity was i was doing like seven jobs on set so it's like i think yeah you were my first dp mm-hmm. you were my first booth i know oh uh, no what was it ufo yeah right that UFO, was a, yeah man so that was the first time i've ever which i remember us having the conversation of like hey man haven't worked with a dp so be patient with me <laughs> yeah <laughs> Not a hundred percent sure how this <laughs> is gonna go, yeah. <laughs> but you were you were nice to me. Thank you. Appreciate you got that. it. But that's been like a thing of just. And now I'm branded as a DP forever. Because and now of you're that branded. Project. Sorry, man. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Which you're totally not. Yeah. You're an amazing DP, <laughs> but you're a director. Yeah. Like stop this DP shit, yeah. bro. <laughs> Get yeah. your ass in the directing chair ASAP because you know, you know, we need Seth, your movies. You know, Seth fired me off of his movie. Good. Did you hear that? <laughs> Good. Yeah. He texted me. He was like, after I sent him um, the bank robber short script or whatever, he uh, he texted me like three days later and was like, hey, man, I just wanted to say I wanted to apologize, but I just like, I can't get out of my mind that like you're a director and I don't want a director to DP my movie. <laughs> and like, I don't know how to say it other than like, you're fired. And I was like, waiting for the joke. He's like... No, no, man. Nope, just fired. <laughs> <laughs> really? I was like, okay, cool. Go away now. <laughs> he's like, you're going to be making movies. Like, but why can we are still you be friends? D- yeah, he's like, why are you going to DP? Don't DP my film. I'll find a DP. Yeah, I definitely think like before, I don't think those things were distractions, but I think we're both at the place now where they are distractions to where it's like a day goes by that we're not headed in that direction. We're headed in a different one. Yeah, for sure. Because before it was like, there's all this time in between things. Yeah. Whereas now it's so fast paced. And even when you're not doing something, you need to be prepping 10 because they might want one when the time comes yep. that they're calling, you know? Yep. So yeah, man, I, I agree with him. You should be fired. <laughs> I'll never ask you to DP again. Perfect. I want to see your movies. I know I, there's so many directors that won't hire me anymore. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a good thing. That means everybody's seeing like... Yeah, no, it's good. It's totally... This it's is totally, who you really are. It's totally good. Yeah. I, I think for me, DPing like ended up being my grad program, basically. Totally. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it was film school for me was yeah. DPing. And I had the great fortune of like working with some really great directors and some really bad directors like which was like those were, yes exactly <laughs> those both were like equally instructive yeah you know but yeah i, I graduated from school and i got kicked out of the house <laughs> now go good. make your own yeah, living exactly boy. <laughs> get out of here go make your own gotta go gotta go do my own thing now <laughs> that's great but it, i mean it's interesting i mean going back to the collaborative collaborator thing yeah. is like is interesting as you know pulling you on it was like oh that's why you have a dp you yeah. know especially like UFO, yeah, was its own unique thing where it was just like crazy. Everything went wrong. So we really didn't have a ton of time to really make the thing. Whereas Ghost House was still last minute. You showed up on set and then we talked about this is what and why. But we had time to actually have that discussion, Mm -hmm. you know, and just make the thing together. And that was one of the first times of like, oh, man, this is great. Mm -hmm. It was just because everything was made a thousand times better than it would have been because I had that collaborated with me. And it was the first time I really felt that marriage of the, you know, oh, this is 
this is my set wife yeah <laughs> or set husband yeah yeah for uh, sure and you know we're doing this together it's like that's the person that i've always felt most collaborative with on set is like this is the person i'm making this with right now yeah and of course the actors as well but just talking crew wise and then just bringing on the composer and you know now working with lucas the editor yeah. which i found thanks to you which yeah. thank you for that yeah just bringing in those collaborators is just finding out that you know my job is to back off see what the film is and then just put it in the hands of people who are way more talented in those certain areas yep. than me. And just when they start veering a little bit left, going, ah, no, 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 turn the wheel right. Okay, mm -hmm. there you go. Continue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. have you found, because I mean, you, you were a DP. Mm -hmm. Now you're directing. Mm -hmm. You're bringing in DPs. Have you found it hard to let go of those reins and do that? Yes. Hand it to them and, and say, okay, now add your vision to this? Yes, definitely. I think... Um, I just shot my first project on film. Um, right. The last the spot, Nike commercial. the Nike commercial I did was on film. That's so out, right? It is, yeah. Okay, it's on. It was on sixteen, and I set myself up to do that. So I have been shooting kind of thirty five millimeter still photography for my own, just to get kind of comfortable with exposing film and not being afraid to like shoot something and then know that it's I'm not going to see if I got it until it comes back. Um, and then a buddy of mine bought an XTR, like a 16 mil camera, and we shot just a little short just for the heck of it and got comfortable with that. And then this Nike job came up and I said, I think we should shoot it on film because of the way they were describing how they wanted it to look and you know all this stuff. And that experience was really amazing, actually, because I don't know how to shoot film. Like, I don't know how to DP film. I don't even know. How, I don't know how to load the canisters. I don't know how to, you know, load the mag. I call it a canister. It's not even a canister. I don't <laughs> right. know how to load the yeah. mags. You're you know, like, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. I, like, I don't know how to do that. And so for the first time, I felt like I had a proper relationship with my DP, which is, this is how I want it to look. This is kind of the movement and feel that I wanted to have. I opt like one or two times uh, just to kind of like get a feel for it. But like more or less, like he DP'd it all. And I didn't see the footage till we got the rushes back, you know? And that was, I think, the first time that I've been like, oh, okay, this is what it feels like to have a DP. And I couldn't have done it if I wanted to. Do. Um, and so I think for me... I've been pitching film a lot lately, not because I think film is like, I mean, everybody likes shooting film and it's like a bit of a hip thing at the moment. But sure. for me, it's actually forcing me to work with DPs in a collaborative way. It's that's creating like, that separation. It's creating a separation that's like very useful for me as a director right now because I can't do what they're doing. Right. So it just forces you to let them do their thing yeah. and focus on what you should focus exactly. on. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, and I took a directing actors workshop at the beginning of this year. And then I just uh, co-directed a short with... Um, this woman who runs a theater company in Scotland. And uh, we have one more that we want to do together. And I literally, I basically handled all the kind of like directing that was camera related, blocking, all of that kind of stuff. And she basically ran the room for the actors. And we both were doing that because both of us, are, like we're the inverse of each other. I'm not as comfortable with actors as she is. She doesn't know how to construct a film, you know, shot by shot on set. And so... Like, that's been a really great relationship. So I feel like I've been spending this year trying to do the things that I feel like have been deficiencies in my kind of directing skill set. Yeah, getting those notches on the belt. Yeah, I mean, because I do think that, like, you know, the tendency, especially for D a DP is, and I felt this way on the Heights, is um, I think we accomplished something cool, but I think I also shot my way around bad directing, mm. basically. So there would be moments in which, the performance isn't working or I'm not clear about a certain thing that I should be clear on or, you know, for whatever reason, like I ran into a directing problem and I just like shot my way around it. You know, mm, I was like, oh, gotcha, I can do sure. these two takes and that, and I'm sure I can make something out of it later. And so I think that for me is like, has been the most important thing is that I don't want to use the fact that I can shoot as a way to like solve my directing problems because it's not solving a problem. Absolutely. You know, that's interesting. Directing problems. Mm -hmm. You find them often. Mm -hmm. I think performance is some of the, the hardest bits is yes. where it's like something's not quite hitting. Sometimes it's like a gut thing. Like I know you're in the ballpark, but you're not connecting. Yeah. And I, I don't 100% know how to articulate that. And sometimes for me, at least, 
I'll just keep running it and mm. then, you know, shift a little this way, run it again, shift a little that way, run it again. And that also gives me time to think and figure it out. Mm. So it's like, I'm running takes that I know I'm not using any of these, Yeah, yeah. but I'm watching and I'm, why is this not connecting? You know, I'm the audience. Why is this not hitting me? Mm. What about this is wrong? And then I usually come up with an idea. Sometimes I've just brought it to, you know, most of, if, if I'm dealing with, cause I've, I deal with both, you know, like new actors or, you know, people who are just willing to do it and then, you know, proper trained yeah. seasoned talent, which has been a little more recent over the past few years. And with them, I've always been like, you know, this isn't working. What do you think? Why? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I've, I've actually noticed and have you noticed this is like, I put them in a box and I shouldn't have and it's killing the scene. Like How I so? told them, like you walk in and this is what you're thinking. And then when this happens, this is why. And you know, when, uh, which sometimes it, you know, I do both. Sometimes it works. And it's like, you know, when she says this, it, it, it hits you like this. And you know, when, you know, you were, you, here's a dumb example that I'm just plucking out from, you know, my short film tell, like when, uh, when you were young and you know, you lied to your parents and then they realized it. Do you remember what that felt like in your stomach? You know what I mean? That very specific mm -hmm. feeling. Oh yeah, I did. It's that. And that, that one actually worked oddly, but you know, doing stuff like that sometimes, especially when there's several people playing the scene, especially in like something like a master, I've noticed that creating that box often is a bad thing because I'm also enforcing me on them instead of letting them be the character. You know what I mean? Hmm. So instead, I've kind of shifted to what the intention is, not what they're thinking or feeling. Sometimes I do, you know, when it's, but that's usually more of an intensity thing. So for example, I notice I curse a lot too when I'm directing for some reason, <laughs> but there you have it. Uh, so like, Fuck. If, <laughs> fucking yeah, you know, uh, so it's like, you know, you come in and there's this moment of intensity, but it's a quiet room. And, you know, I mean, anyone would, you know, it's just like, where's, that level where should the knob be exactly mm. are we at an eight are we at a nine feels mm. like an eight but it's really freaking quiet and i was just sitting there doing nothing and now i'm supposed to be at a nine so how do i like how do i get that there so there was something specific where something intense needed to happen and it's like you come in and it's in, it's intensity like right off the bat it's intensity but okay now i'll be back and let's just we're gonna roll cameras and everybody set and let's get the haze going and oh, oh chase is fixing a light real quick okay cool and okay Yep, five minutes later and we're ready let's go and now you're supposed to come in at, a, at an 11 mm. so it's like i found uh to do that stuff it would be like don't cut and um you know i would just go in there fast and hot and just be like well, you get your fucking ass in there and you know what mm. i mean and you know, not like cursing at them but telling them what they're thinking like are you, you know you're fucking kidding me this is happening and you know just taking it to that and mm. sort of giving them what i want them to give me and i've noticed that worked with some people and then some people I didn't even try it with because it's like, this is not going to go for you. You don't mm. need that. And I'm just like, hey, when you come in here, be an 11, okay? All right, cool. Whenever you're ready. <laughs> and yeah, they yeah. come in at an 11. Yeah. And I don't think either one is wrong so far, especially on the talent side. Like just some people need different things, it mm -hmm. seems. Have you experienced any of that? Does any of that make sense to you? It does. Yeah, for sure. No, I mean, it's really interesting working with Sandy. She, she runs a theater company in Scotland called Poor Boy. And the short that we did together was like nine pages of dialogue. And yeah. we just, we did it in one day, which <laughs> wow. is crazy, but it wasn't because the day before we rehearsed all day mm. so that when we came in we did like two or three takes of each setup and then moved on but what was really interesting was that she was able to identify kind of when they were starting to tire out basically and when like basically they were kind of reaching the end of their ability to deliver a certain emotion because they've spent it you yeah know? and i think that was interesting to me i hadn't necessarily noticed that before and then there was one scene up on the rooftop in which it was a very emotional scene and like we shot it once and it was great and the actor was like really starting to lock in and feel it and so we just we didn't even cut like we just said let's do it right away again yeah. you know and we did it again and it was really great and then there was like a camera issue like the card on this camera like spit out a weird error and we had to swap cards but we were on the roof and it was a tiny crew and so the ac had forgotten the card down so uh, you know it's like this whole you just thing feel right feel that the you're just like oh my god like we were just getting to this place where yeah. things were happening and i remember sandy pulled the actor aside and said hey i want you to go keep your keep your engine running is what she said and basically was like sent him away to not talk with anyone or be around and he just like went around the backside of the 
roof and like no one talked to him for the three minutes it took to like get the new card and get everything up and it was like okay we're ready and she went and we called action she didn't even like tell him we were ready to go again it was just like let's get the camera up rolling great okay cool and then she just said action loud enough for him to hear it and he like walked into the scene and like it was the take we used you know i mean it was like amazing that's great but that idea of like being very in tune with your actors and knowing when they're kind of like peaking and valleying and how to kind of help them yeah i think is like really important i think the, the main thing that i learned directing wise that i've been working on is the root of most bad directing is that you tell your actors what you want the result to be mm-hmm. instead of giving them the tools to have a subjective experience on camera because that's you know you don't want them to act a certain way you want them to have an actual experience in some right, capacity, right. Live some in the emotional moment. experience sure and i think that's a obvious realization but i think that like how that expresses itself in directing i think was kind of revelatory for me in some way like understanding how many times i was actually asking for a result instead of like giving them something to do do you have an example or? um yeah i mean i would say like in the heights when jesse comes out on stage and Ben is performing and he's about to quit the band or whatever. And I basically told her, I need you to like have an emotional reaction to him, (laughs) like on stage, basically like this, this is like the last goodbye. And it just wasn't working. And what I didn't realize, uh, we were doing close-ups of her on the side stage. And what I realized when we were filming was that she as a human, and I think as the character was feeling really self-conscious about walking out onto the stage because we had 50 or 60 extras and you know, 25 crew. So there's like hundred people in the room. Um, and she has to walk out on stage and sing with him. And she's not a singer. So it was like definitely a moment. And basically she was having to work herself up to go out on stage. And we noticed it happening. And I realized like, oh, her emotional reaction is happening side stage to like come out. Like she has to have the emotional reaction that I was hoping she would have on stage by herself on the side stage before she comes out there. And basically I told her, I want you to look at everyone in the room before you walk out to sing with Ben. And the first time she did that, she looked around, looked around, looked around, and you could see her like getting more and more kind of like nervous. She teared up and then looked at Ben with tears in her eyes and like made an active decision to move out and join the stage with him. And then from there, like it was a real honest moment. And so the rest of the scene played out really well. But I think realizing that I was trying to have her do this prescriptive thing when really all I needed to do is recognize how she was actually responding and lean into that. Yeah. You know, you're yeah. embarrassed right now. Acknowledge your embarrassment you know, and that's the gateway to the honest emotion. That's great. It's like that kind of stuff that, you know, I mean, directing is really hard. Yeah. I took this, the directing workshop and I told the teacher or whatever on the last day, I was like, this workshop is the first time and the only time I've ever felt like I understood why I cannot DP my own features. Why is that? There's too much to do uh-huh. <laughs> as the director. Yeah. It's not possible. That's why I stopped um, putting hands on camera because I like operating because mm-hmm. I like being, I mean, if it's like a tight enough action bit, like a, you know, hand to hand sort of thing, sure. I'll still get hands on camera. But for anything else, it's just, I don't, I don't want to touch it. I need to be like paying attention to, sometimes I don't, well, the, for the first time ever in ballistic, I've stepped away from the monitor even mm-hmm. and just went and stood next to the camera and just watched my actors which I'd never done that before. Yeah. For the most part, I'm looking through the monitor because I want to see the moment like the audience is going to see the moment. But when trying to like navigate something that's not quite working, I just walked away from the monitor and gotten, you know, yeah. was able to look at their eyes a lot better. Uh, yeah, but totally just being able to fully focus on what's happening within those frame lines only and just concentrating on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, directing performance is full body sport for sure yeah and it's it's just it's a weird thing too because i find at least there's no one right way to do it like i've done it a bunch of ways like i i agree with the result directing but i have had actors be like well hold on let me ask you do you just want me to be more mad i'm like well yeah and then they did it and i was like well that was exactly right okay (laughs) didn't need to do that fancy uh... yeah i only know like two i've only worked with two actors that were straight up like that like dude don't give me that stuff just do you want me to come in there mad or do you want me to be what do you want me to do and i'll do it Hmm. like you give them a target they're hitting the target wow that's wow that's interesting but that's part of it too is that like actors are human beings so like 
everybody's going to respond differently. Everybody's going to need different things. You but know? it's hard. It's like, how do you figure that out with them? Like, you just have to be a psychologist. Yeah. Well, and I think you have to, I mean, did you guys rehearse for ballistic at all? No. Yeah. So I think I'm becoming convinced that like rehearsal is in fact likely going to be the key to making good work. Yeah. I would love to. Like in ballistic, I would, we would rehearse before I got everything set up, especially one of the key scenes we rehearsed in an empty room. But I would love to, before we're on set with all that stress, just rehearse. Yeah. I just never had that luxury yet. Yeah. No, this short that I just did, first time I've ever seen a rehearsal because I didn't know. I mean, on the Heights, David and Betsy, my two actors, met each other at like 11 o'clock at night the day before we rolled camera. Oh, wow. And they're supposed to have all that like cr- history chemistry. And all and, yeah. Yeah, so Were just you like, nervous about that? Like, are they going to click? Like, is that going to, oh, yeah. is it going to feel like that on camera? Or? Totally. That's kind of a dice roll for sure. Yeah, for sure. It was a little. Worked out. It, that it, whole it felt thing. That way. That whole, the whole project was a dice roll. But I think like seeing how Sandy ran this rehearsal and like what we were able to accomplish in one day because of it was like, I, I mean, I'll definitely be incorporating rehearsals moving forward for sure. Did you kind of get a gauge of what style the actors would need directorially from the rehearsal, uh-huh. do you think? I definitely, like, part of it was kind of developing language and understanding. One of the actors wanted to know why we were going to do something again. It's like very important, you know. Basically, it was like, I need to know that it's not about me. Because if it is about me, I need to know what needs to be different. Like, oh, I, I don't uh-huh. want to, I don't want to think we're running it again because I did something wrong and yeah. you're not telling me why. Yeah, we're doing another take. Why? Right. Was it right. for camera? Was it? Yeah. Exactly. Gotcha. So, and then the other actor was like, barely even wanted to know when the camera's rolling. It was just like, let us do this thing. I'm not going to be aware of the camera. I don't really care. You know, whatever. You want to do 10 takes? Great. Like, I'm just focused on kind of what's happening. And that relationship was discovered in rehearsal. That reality was discovered in rehearsal. That's great. Yeah, that sounds awesome because I'm always just trying to navigate that and figure that out when Mm -hmm. we're already there. And sometimes, you know, I mean, with you and I, when we've worked together, it's like the actors are rehearsing the scene with the camera. Yeah, for sure. And that's like, that's just crazy. I mean, that wasn't dramatic, so it's a little easier. Sure. But it's, you know, it's still the same. Yeah, totally. (laughs) (laughs) But it's, you know, it's funny. It's like directing and us figuring out what we want to do and where we want to go. It's really like, how do I utilize people for an end result for an audience yes and um i think i think a big part of it has been like not take advantage of people but collaborate with people Uh because it's like especially when you write you write this thing it's in your head and it's like you kind of gotta it's your child and now you gotta let the village help raise the child Mm -hmm. it's really freaking weird Mm -hmm. and that's been it's been a nice education for me because it's been so slow like you know now i'm working with a dp now i have my dp and my you know sound guy now i have my dp my sound guy and my whole camera department and so it's been like a nice sort of slow burn into really appreciating everybody that's there and having them be a part of the project and not turn people into hammers and nails you know yes is that something that's ever in your head or is just organically become that or what specifically just the process of making a thing and not you make the thing on your own and you're just using tools who are oh humans. yeah yeah no i mean i think because there's definitely famous directors that we could name that do that yeah and they make great work i've never been a like auteur type of person i I don't believe in it i i really don't i don't think it's possible to do it well without including a lot of people so for anyone to be considered an auteur i think means they're just stealing credit from other people because that's not a thing did you write the music did you mix the sound did you totally yeah that's not a thing so i think um i mean there's definitely people who their vision is imprinted more on the final project than others yeah totally some are a collection of the community more more than totally than others, but it's not purely that. No, I've always wanted someone working on my projects to feel like when they see the final thing that they can point to something that they feel like they contributed specifically. Yeah. Not just generally, but like, up oh, that scene wouldn't have happened if I hadn't done X, Y, or Z, yeah. you know, or that wouldn't have come out a certain way if I hadn't been involved. While at the same time, I want the final product to feel like I made it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's like commercials have been really great for that experience because for whatever reason, like the commercials I'm working on have gotten bigger. And so like in December, I directed a commercial with 85 crew 
Well, uh, and I didn't know any of them. I never met any of them. And yet at the end of the day, like, looked like I shot it, looked like I made it. And I think that's a good thing. The lights just Should went Should we off. just tell them that the lights cut out? Yeah, the lights went out. We're both nervous. Come back on. <laughs> there it is. The it's lights back, are on. back on. It's a motion sensor light. <laughs> <laughs> the bar's closed. The bar's closed. We talked too yeah. long. No, but I think. I think that's just like, uh, you know, the fact that you just have a specific vision and you know how to articulate that and to who. Yes. But I guess my point is, is that as the director, like having a vision and, and a kind of thing that you make is not mutually exclusive from allowing, like inviting your crew to collaborate in a way that they feel some kind of ownership or contribution to that You're like the good idea selector, basically. Yeah. And I think that like, I mean, it's like a coach on a baseball team or something, you know, Mm -hmm. it's like, you know what your team is capable of and you shift players around and like put them in different combinations and like the end result hopefully is that you win the game. And I think that as a director, that's your job. You, you're casting your crew as much as you're casting your actors. Yeah, you know? totally. And so I think if you cast your crew in a way that helps you extend your ability to say something, and hopefully that's a mutually beneficial relationship. You know? Yeah, 100%. And it's kind of like, I mean, that's going to be a thing no matter what, because, you know, going back to the child <laughs> thing is it, it is your baby and other people, teachers and whatnot, will help raise the baby, but nobody's going to care about that kid as much no. as you. Yeah. No one. No. So you're the one like shepherding it all the way through yeah. and the one that has all the passion for it. I mean, other people will be passionate about it, but not like you. No, no, definitely. You're the one staying up late at night. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Worrying, about worrying about what you should have done. The baby. Could have done. Yeah. Would have done if you'd been smarter. Uh huh. Yeah. It's never done. Yeah. Cause when I would DP stuff, I would shoot it, we would rap. And then, like, if I generally felt like everyone was happy, then I would kind of be like, okay, cool. Like, I think I did a good job and yeah. I'd move, move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that was like the first new feeling I had when I directed was like the second we wrapped and like things are being torn down and packed up this almost immediate and sudden wave of panic. Oh my God, you should have done this. Why didn't you do this? And uh, you could have done this. And here's how you could have solved this problem. What did and, I like, even get? What, what did, did we you even, even shoot? Get? Did we even like, we didn't, we, we didn't get anything. Like we don't have anything that we could use. You Am know, I even going to be able to cut that yes. scene? Like I think that, that kind of overwhelming and very lonely amount yeah. of replay, it kind of knocked me on my ass the first time I directed. And that feels unique to the job. <laughs> yeah. And it feels like the nothing in life is free kind of moment, which is like, you know, it's the flip side of like getting to be the one who's trying to bring a vision to life. Is yeah. that, like I've always thought about it in terms of like when I've helped on other people's projects is like, did I give them what they wanted? And then on my own projects, it's just this terror that I'm not giving the story what it deserves. Hmm. And it's That's just, interesting. yeah, just feeling like, was I enough for this story? Yeah. Was I, you know, would somebody else have been better for you? <laughs> you yeah, I mean? yeah. Yeah, that's interesting and sad. It is. <laughs> it is. Me and Seth have a lot of depressing conversations about the craft of directing. Yeah, it's really, it's not that cool, actually. <laughs> that's what I was, I always <laughs> I talk about, especially with Seth. I need to start a thread with you with yeah. this, where we just hate ourselves. Yeah. Where it's just like, it's such a masochistic career choice. It is. Where you just, it's just painful. Yeah. So it's like anybody who's not doing it because there is no choice, like there's no other choice. Yeah. I can't not do this. It's chosen for me. There's no choice. It's like, what are you doing? Like, if you're not that passionate about it, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Go do something else where you hate yourself a lot less. Yeah, no, I I think, too, there's a lot of other crew positions that you can, like, make a contribution, be a part of some really awesome stuff. And, like, you don't have to be the director or even the DP. There's ways to be, like, vitally involved and important in some very amazing projects that you don't have to like shoulder the burden of like (laughs) it (laughs) being your thing the pain the torment because i think for some people like it's too much it's just too much yeah i think for me like i've always known that like the directing part was it's the thing i've been most afraid of Mm -hmm. and so i've known that that was coming at some point but yeah man especially as somebody deep like now when i if I ever DP something, I'll DP something like every once in a while, somebody asks a favor or something. And uh, it's amazing. I love it. He's just like, this I'm is like, a nice vacation. What do you want, man? You want to shoot the thing? Okay, great. No sure, problem. Sure, baby. You that's what it. you need. I give you what you need. <laughs> yeah, it's like so easy. And like, 
amazing sipping on coffee yeah it's like great you know, no it, it's like the difference between like you get to eat when it's time versus you do not oh no i never when i'm directing i don't eat it's like i don't eat breakfast i found out that i can't no. even when i'm not here's the thing i'll say it in public even when i'm not nervous i've noticed i cannot eat breakfast in the morning or i will throw up yeah it's like i mean of course you're nervous but i mean i'm not like stage fright nervous on one production i didn't even feel nervous i'm like oh okay let's do this and then it's like i dry heaved i'm like <laughs> what is this <laughs> oh my but then God. by lunch i'm totally fine so it's like lunch and dinner i'll eat it real quick because i know i have to right but it's always like how fast can this go down <laughs> oh my god the very first thing i ever directed of any substance it was a reality tv promo for vh1 way back like 2011 right <laughs> I was technically DPing, but it's like one of those things where like the producer was kind of directing and whatever. But it was in Los Angeles and I like freaked out. Guess how much the total budget was? Uh, $5,000. What? The whole production was $5,000. I thought that was going to a $500,000. $5,000. And that included like... this was for VH1? VH1, yeah. And uh, it was like all on 5Ds. But I like freaked out because I'd never done this before. So I flew all my friends out <laughs> i flew out like four people including the sound guy from texas <laughs> to los angeles and we we um shot at smashbox studios which is like it's milk studios now it's like big studio mm-hmm. and they rent all the gear this is like the budget they have for crew and gear and um, so your entire budget was like hotels and flights yes 100 yeah. <laughs> percent. i spent the i spent it all on flying my <laughs> right. like friends out and uh, we were driving to set on the first day. And I mean, dude, this is like reality TV people come in, sit in a chair and answer questions that I'm not even asking. Like the producer's asking. All I have to do is press record on the camera. Right. And uh, we were driving to set and I was like, oh, pull over, <laughs> pull over. And I had to get out on Santa Monica Boulevard and I puked on the ground. <laughs> Like on the sidewalk, Santa Monica Boulevard, on the way to my first shoot, there's three people in that car and periodically still to this day, I get a random text saying, you remember that one time you made us pull over the car and you puked on the ground on your way to set? It's, yeah. I'll never live it down for the rest of my life. It's it's all of us though, man. I, was like, I didn't puke on a, a ballistic, but I, I dry heaved a couple of times. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, dude. It's like in the mornings. I don't know what it is. In the mornings oh before God. it gets started, it's just like, I don't know. You just feel the weight of like... Like, there is 80 people <laughs> waiting for me to show up on yeah. set and be right yep. over and over and over again. That's that's like the long and short of it is oh I God. have to show up and be right. and oh, Or all this money and all of their time and all of their effort was for nothing. Yeah. It's for something that they're ashamed of and not proud of. And I think that kind of hits you whether you know it or not in the beginning. It's, at least that's what I've unpacked from it. Yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's do it. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> but I talked to a few friends that have done, you know, some pretty major features yeah. for major studios, and they're like, yeah, that's about right. <laughs> and they're like, like, oh God, and, it I, get and I'm better. just like, man, I cannot eat. It's like, even when I eat lunch and dinner, it's like, I'm getting the bare minimum down to keep like enough in the tank to keep going. Yep. And they're like, oh, that's just because you've done short films. It's like, you do a feature after you get past like your second week, you'll be fine. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. Well, okay. Okay, great. <laughs> but then another friend of mine was like, yeah, I, I pretty much never ate. I yeah. lost so much weight on that movie. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> see, I should be a director. That's right. <laughs> That'll be my like yearly diet is like shoot a movie. Make a movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. So, you know, long format narrative is obviously what you want to do. You want to yeah, be a feature I mean, film director. I think so. I like, I say that as someone who hasn't made them before. But I mean, clearly knowing you and knowing what you're doing, it seems like a have to for you. Yes. So. Yeah. That's what you're going to do. Yes, for sure. And I've seen your stuff. It's what you're going to do. <laughs> so it's like, what's, you know, do you have like a conscious next step or is it like, you know, the commercials pay the bills, but also give you a playground to test ideas and get to wrap your head around things. And then you're in the background working on what hopefully will be your first feature. Is that what you're kind of going at? Um, I'm in an interesting time to record this podcast because um, basically the stages script, which I did the short, the hi- we wrote and then directed my short called The Heights, which and is the, about the film the band. is called Stages. And then right. between the time that we shot The Heights and when we put it out, myself, Bradley Jackson, and Dan Steele wrote the feature version of the film, which is now called Stages. So there's three writers on your feature. Yeah. So I did basically, Dan did the first 60 pages. And did a book in like big TV shows and became unavailable. And Bradley came in and 
basically kind of stitched it together and wrote the the next 35 pages or so. And then I've kind of come in now and am, am shifting things around and doing a rewrite. So that's been kicking around for a while. But we originally were going to, you know, we put together investor deck and a treatment and the whole thing of the script. We have the short. We've got a lot of materials to kind of say this is what it would be. And we've been out trying to raise some money to go make this feature. And I just had a conversation last week. It was Tribeca Film Festival in New York. And um, Thomas Bensky, who's the head head of Pulse, founder of Pulse, is really the person who's kind of pushing forward the feature and television projects at the company. Um, there's an indie film production company called Parts and Labor, which is like an incredible... I mean, they've done a good chunk of the A24 films, and like oh, really wow, amazing. Nice. And they, one of their partners left and now is at Pulse as like development guy for features. So like they've got a really great kind of staff of people working on independent features. And so I set a meeting with Thomas and just said like, I want to make a movie. How do I make a movie? And he, this was probably three or four months ago. And I told him about the movie and he basically was like, okay, sounds good cool, I guess. Uh, send me the script. What else? You know? Yeah. And that conversation like kind of scared me enough that I didn't ever send him the script. Yeah. And then I was like, I need to rewrite the script before I send him the script. But then I basically realized I can't really rewrite the script until I like have David really attached to the film because I feel like the film is really about his music and... I need him involved. And so I had a really great conversation with him that kind of helped focus things. And then I went to a concert and like had this really kind of amazing epiphany of like, this is why I wanted to make this movie. I haven't been able to answer this question until this moment, basically. And so with all of that, I, I sent the investor deck to, to Thomas and just was like, I think I want to make this movie and I can tell you why. And he was like, okay, great. I'll be in New York for Tribeca. We should meet up. So I went and met up with him and, uh, Basically, very long story short, he was like, why do you want to make this movie, you know? And he was like, it can be a lot of things. It could be that you just happen to know this world really well and you know that, like, directing features is going to be tough, but at least you won't be worried about the authenticity of the world you're trying to create or maybe there's a specific scene that you really love that you want to direct or I don't know, like, why? And I kind of told him, I said, I feel like this is a film that I can make tomorrow, I know how to make this movie. And I think for me, I like keep putting all my hopes and dreams in this one project. And it every time I kind of lean my weight on it, it just starts to buckle. It's just like, it can't support the kind of like... Scrutiny. Yes. Right. It's not that kind of movie. There's not a huge dramatic arc. There's no like crazy anything. You know, it's just like... If you try to think about, you know, spending a lot of money on making it, it feels like, oh, maybe I should spend it on something else, you know? Right. And so we kind of like had that conversation and he was like, well, I mean, you said you could make this movie tomorrow. Like, what do you need to make it tomorrow? You know? I was like, well, money. Money, yeah. yeah. And he was like, well, is there a world in which you could make this movie in a significantly smaller amount of days for a lot less money than you have in this investor deck? I was like, well, I mean, Yeah. I think so. You know, I mean, like, if we got really scrappy, I know all the venues, I know all the musicians, with all of my work in all the cities that I work in, I have crew that are, like, chomping at the bit to do a narrative project with me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think so. It won't be fun, you know, <laughs> but, like, yes, I think we could. Anyway, longer story short, he just was like, I think this is a movie that you need to just make, like, immediately. Because that's another skill set to have as a director that, like... You can be scrappy and go like make a thing and it does the budget doesn't have to be crazy and you're mm -hmm. just like go make the thing, you know? And then you've made your first movie and like you can get over it and like worry about what the next movie is, you know? Cause he asked me, he was like, Who are your favorite directors? What are some of your favorite movies? And I'm saying like Children of Men, Alfonso <laughs> Giron, <laughs> right. yeah, big yeah. movies. And he I kind of say all my favorite movies. So I need seventy like, million dollars. Yeah, yeah. And, and he's uh, like, So why are you like making a tiny music film with very little dramatic arc? And I was like, well, because I think I could make it, basically. Right. You know, and he's like, great, then make it and then move on and worry about the kind of bigger ideas once you've made a film. That's interesting. And so he was like, well, when when would you need to make it? And I was like, well, August, because fall tour kicks up and all the musicians will disappear and every venue will be booked from September to December. And he was like, okay, well, you need to shoot in August then you need to prep it in July you need to cast it and do rewrites in June and you need to raise your money in May. And he was like, can you do that? I was like, 
I don't know. I guess we can try. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Give it a shot. And he was like, I think you can. It's not very much money. And then it's the precise amount of money that nobody's going to care. They're going to invest in you. They don't need to see a script. They don't right. care. It's just like, go make the movie. You know, and it's going to be a tiny crew and we'll go make a movie. So I think for me, all that being said, <laughs> the 30 minute story, the biggest barrier for me is that I can talk myself out of pretty much anything. 100%. Right. Yep. Including even this, which feels like there's momentum to it now. Mm -hmm. I know that this story needs to be rewritten to fit the new constraints. Yeah. And I'm sure I'll convince myself it's not good enough and we shouldn't make it and, you know, whatever. But I do think that, like, the fact that I keep wanting to talk myself out of doing it means that it probably matters less that what it is, but that I need to get one movie made so that I can like get over the fact that I haven't made a movie. Right. Thomas did say something that was very interesting. He said the first, your first movie doesn't have to be great. It doesn't even have to be that good. It just has to have three or four moments that connect emotionally with an audience. If it has three or four moments that connect with an audience, it'll be enough for people to go like, huh, I wonder what he will do next. Yeah. And if that's all you need out of your first movie is people going like, huh, I would check out what that guy made next. Interesting. That you don't need to spend a lot of time like freaking out about it being like a masterpiece. It's not yeah. going to be a masterpiece, you know? Totally. You just have to make it. For sure. I mean, that, that, that even goes for like short films. It's like, just yeah. don't waste your time trying to make perfection. Just get something done and out there. Yeah. So, so the answer is you're probably about to make it, hopefully. The idea would be that we will give it a really good shot to try and make something this summer. Yeah. Right. A micro budget thing that a micro budget feature this summer that will at least like get the first film out of the way. That's awesome, man. Yeah. That means you're going to do it first. You bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking bastard. <laughs> oh boy. I'm not even going to be happy for you. I'm just yeah, going to be see, here mad. Yeah. But the thing is, is that you have ideas that people are going to want to pay you a lot of money to work on. <laughs> yeah. I, have I don't know. Maybe tiny, <laughs> sad human sized drama movies in my heart right. that like people are going to go it's hard to get cool made, dude yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not paying for it <laughs> right my problem you know. is a lot of the ideas I have they're like uh that's a really big budget there man yeah no <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, well damn it I think you'll find the right person though because I, I mean especially as you keep making these bigger shorts like I think at some point you're going to cross the threshold where it's like I mean because if you make an expensive short the only difference between a short and a feature is more days. Right. But you're going to spend the same amount of money every day as you mm -hmm. did on your big shorts. Totally. It's just that you get to do it for 25 days or 35 days or whatever it is yeah. instead. And so, like, you're actually proving that you can manage that amount of budget on a day-to-day -day basis. It's right. just that you're doing it for four days instead yeah. of 30. I'm, I'm always scared about that, like... 30 days where it's like, man, I would want 60. Because it's like, I do a lot of takes and I take my time. Mm -hmm. I don't move very fast. <laughs> yeah, but you, <laughs> you don't know? have to move fast. That's what your AD's for. That's a good point. I had a good first AD in, uh, in LA for Ballistic. Yeah. I loved him. Good first AD is like a lifesaver. That's a very interesting relationship. It is. For sure. Very. Yeah. And the, and the, and the right one is just like, God, I love you so much. Yeah. And then sometimes, God, I hate you so much. <laughs> I know. Yeah. my I had a kind of like contentious relationships with my ADs when I was mostly doing commercials because it always kind of felt like my ADs felt like if we ended our day on time and if we got out of there on time and didn't go into overtime or didn't go over budget then like they were super stoked they didn't really care about what we got it was mm. just did we get it right you know because i'm good i did my job you right. know and then when i the first ad that i worked with on the heights cared as much as i did about what the quality of each of the scenes and the takes were and that was kind of the first relationship i had where i was like oh there's a reason that they're called the first assistant director. They're helping you direct. Yeah. Like they really are. It's a really crucial role to find someone that you really click with because they can help you head off problems way ahead of time. Yeah, man. Well, we covered a lot of things. Hopefully, Lots of things. Hopefully the next time I have you on is because we're talking about the process of going through your first feature, <laughs> which will be in a Likewise. couple months, hopefully. I think mine's a little further yours out than yours. probably further out than mine, but yeah, but yeah mine will be... Very, very small. Very yeah. small. <laughs> Who knows? Mine might be too. I might just have to do it myself. That's right. <laughs> that, that's the thing, man. It's like, we both want to do it. And it's, I think we're going about it the same way pretty much now. It's just like, 
I want to do it. If nobody's going to give it to me, then I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Cause it's just, you know, like we were talking about before we started, it's just like hit the point of like enough with this, not making movies BS. I yeah. just can't do it anymore. Yeah, for sure. So it's just like, now it's time. So yep. if nobody's going to give it to me, fine, I'll just go do it. I support you. I support you. <laughs> Let's and hug off mic. Scene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just cutting it there. Yeah. Awesome. And that's it for today. Again, go to filmriot.com forward slash podcast. Find the episode page for this episode. And you can find a lot of Ryan's work and how to connect with him online. He's very active on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find me on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash Ryan underscore Conley. And on our website page, you will find all the goodies for our sponsors as well. And next week, we're going to be talking to Rob Kreckel, who is the audio lead for Naughty Dog, currently working on Last of Us 2. He also did all of the sound uh, for Ballistic, so definitely come back for that one. And until then, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat. Repeat.